Amen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, kids, you can go ahead and be dismissed. The older kids that need to go back to Sunday school in the back there. Looks like they're on their way. Very good. Well, welcome, everybody. My name's Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at Veritas Dubuque. Glad to have you here this morning. I know it's a little gloomy outside. Usually we get the sunshine in here, so we're having to, you know, we're having to bring the energy ourselves this morning, so that's okay. We can do that. Um, I got to say at the top of the message here, it is September 22nd, so um, just want to give a quick happy birthday to uh, Bilbo and Frodo Baggins. Um, So yeah, you can clap for that if you want to. You don't have to though. Uh, Okay, sorry. Get that out of the way. Jacob Faber is reading Lord of the Rings for the first time, and this morning he read the part where it says that September 22nd is their birthday, so we had to acknowledge it. Okay, so we're going to be in Romans chapter 4 this morning, so you can go ahead and flip uh, in your Bibles, turn on your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 4, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 8 this morning. And so what we're going to be thinking about this morning is how we are that song that we just sang is actually like the whole sermon. I could just read the lyrics of that song, basically. Like, we are given the merit of Jesus. We don't do anything to earn it. It's not our own merit. It's all the merit of Jesus that we receive. And what we're thinking about this morning is how we don't do any works to earn this. We don't have anything to earn. Okay, so I'm going to give you an insight into my mind a little bit this morning, so something I was thinking about this week. So whether you like it or not, you get to get a little glimpse into my my mind. I can be kind of a skeptical person uh, if I choose to be. In my head, I I have a lot of skepticism, and so I was wrestling with something this week and thinking about how sometimes in our life, when we do something, it can be an act of faith. Like sometimes our actions can demonstrate our faith. Well, sometimes our actions can also demonstrate our lack of faith. And sometimes it's not exactly clear which it is, especially from the outside. So here's what I was thinking about this week, was Noah's ark, right? Noah is told by God to build this ark, and he does, right? And he trusts God, and he builds the ark, and, and, and so he does this thing that seems kind of crazy, probably. It's not a very typical thing to do at his time, but he does it anyways. He might have seemed crazy to people around him, but he was making this act of faith, right? He was being obedient to God, regardless of what all the people around him thought. Okay, so now here's my skeptical mind. Again, I'm warning you, I'm a little skeptical. What if you could build an ark out of a lack of faith as well? So some of you might know there's an ark museum in Kentucky. There's like a creation museum, and they reconstructed Noah's ark. Here's where my skeptical heart goes. It's like, what if we're supposed to believe that story on faith and not prove it to be true? What if building a second ark is a massive act of unfaith? What if we're trying to prove to ourselves that this actually happened and instead we should be loving and serving God, putting our lives toward other things? Noah wasn't trying to do anything to please men around him. He was obeying God when he built the ark. Do we do the opposite now when we try to build an ark? Okay, like I said, I'm skeptical of it. We'll come back to it. We can, here's my point, like, We can do things that seem really good out of a heart of wanting to prove ourselves or to earn something or to do something on God's behalf that God has already done for us. So I'm coming at everything, like even our Bible reading, like what's your motivation if you go to read the Bible? Are you doing it because God loves you or are you doing it because you're just trying to impress somebody else? What about prayer? Are you praying to be seen by other people? Or are you communicating with your God? So that's my skeptical mind. We'll resolve that, but, but that's my skeptical mind. Is our, our actions a demonstration of our faith or a demonstration of our lack of faith? Sometimes they can be very close. Sometimes they can be very close. So, what do we believe this morning? Do we believe Jesus earned salvation for us, or are we still trying to earn it ourselves? 
Are we doing things in our life where we're trying to earn something that Jesus has already offered to us for free? Are we trying to appear impressive before other men instead of simply receiving a gift? Today, in the sermon, it's not about what we do. It's not about how your life is, right? It's not about what we deserve. It's not about what others think of you. It's not about if your, your life is all put together and pretty or if your life's just a hot mess. It's not about what we do. It's not about what others think. It's not about external things. It's about what do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus gives you his righteousness or do you try to earn it? That's the question. Do you believe or do you work? Do you try to work for it? Paul in the text today is going to look at these two guys, Abraham and David. And these are guys that generally are regarded as very faithful men. Abraham's called obedient by God. David's called a man after God's own heart. And yet Paul is actually using them as examples of people who don't get their righteousness from their works. They receive their righteousness from God. Let's read the text. Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. What then will we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? What did Abraham find? What did Abraham discover? What do we learn from his story, right? If Abraham was justified by his works, he would have something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed, right? In other words, if we try to work for this righteousness, we make God a debtor to us. We try to make God owe us something. To the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes. To the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited for righteousness. Likewise, David also, so he talks about Abraham, now he's talking about David. David also, similarly, speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits with righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven, whose sins are covered, And blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. That's God's word to us this morning. So, we're talking about do we believe or do we work? And here at this church, when we read the Bible, here's what we believe. That's what we're saying this morning. Like, if this is about belief, if this is about faith, these words have the same root, same Greek root. Belief and faith, same thing. If this is what we believe, what is it? This important belief that supersedes all of our actions, more important than any actions that we ever do, what is it? Paul uses these two stories, these stories of Abraham and David, to to demonstrate what we believe. Okay, here's what we believe. The first thing we believe, so important for us to understand this, is that we don't earn. In the economy of God, of our salvation, we don't earn. He's saying in verse 1 that Abraham discovered this. In other words, he's saying that, that this is like what Abraham's story demonstrates. What did Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, find? And then he says if Abraham was justified by works, he'd have something to boast about, but not before God, right? Even if Abraham was the best man that ever lived, He's still unjustified when he comes face to face with God. It doesn't matter if he's the best man that ever lived. What does the scripture say? So it says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, we need to understand the context of where this is said and the story that's going on when when it says this. Okay, so it's back in Genesis 15. It's this story about when God kind of first starts interacting with Abraham. He's saying, Abraham, I'm going to give you a lot of offspring. 
And Abraham, by this point, is already very old, and his wife is already very old. So he's saying, okay, how's this going to work? Abraham, he says, look at the sky and count the stars. If you, are to, if you were able to count them. Look at the stars and count them if you were able, right? Your offspring will be that numerous. That's what God says to Abraham. Even though he's in his 80s, his wife in her 70s. Look at the sky, count the stars. Your offspring will be that numerous. And then it says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So right there, he believed God. Here's the crazy part of the story. Him and his wife, in my opinion, don't seem to act like they believed God. (laughs) So his wife, Sarah, says, okay, God is going to give you many offspring. Well, I'm already in my 70s, so I'm not able to bear children anymore. So this must be the way God's going to do it. She gives Abraham her slave, Hagar. Maybe this is how God's going to bring many children. Abraham gets Hagar pregnant. Obviously, Sarah stops to think about this after the fact, gets kind of upset. It creates a lot of conflict, okay? Skipping over a lot of parts of the story, but eventually they resolve this. God says, no, that's, that's not the way I was planning to bless you, Abraham. You and your wife, Sarah, are going to have children. And God does it. When Abraham is 100 years old, Sarah is 90 years old, they get pregnant. They have Isaac, right? That's how the story goes. So, here's the crazy thing to me. That this verse is before all that happens. Abraham believed God and he credited it to him as righteousness. Somehow, Abraham had faith through all of that. Even through his wife giving him her slave. And they're like, let's try it this way. Somehow, Abraham had faith through all of that. Abraham was credited with God's righteousness despite his works, his acts of unfaith. That's incredible to me. Now, here's the amazing thing. The baby that he had with Hagar, right, he, he, bro- like, he did that against God's will, right? That's, that was not the way God was planning for them to do this. Here's what's amazing about God. He blessed that child. That's Ishmael. Ishmael goes on to have all this fruitful offspring as well. And in fact, it's, it's part of the way God does fulfill his promise to him. Like, these are part of Abraham's offspring. God redeems this thing that Abraham and Sarah did out of unfaith to bring blessing. Okay, back to the beginning. My skeptical self. I'm not telling you this is the right thing to be skeptical of the Ark Museum, by the way. I'm, I'm like confessing this to you. Because here's the thing. Even if I'm right, even if I'm right, and it was an act of unfaith to build the Ark Museum in Kentucky, it's changed so many people's lives. It's been a blessing to so many people. So first of all, I'm probably wrong and I'm probably just skeptical. But second of all, even if I'm right, God is using it to bless people. We just can't get in God's way. Like, no matter what we do, our works are not what saves us. It's God. God is at work through us. When we obey him, even when we disobey him, this is the point. Like, we don't earn it. Either way, whether we build the Ark Museum or not, guess what? It's not what we do that earns our salvation. We are used to, in this culture, something called meritocracy. Have you guys ever heard this word, meritocracy? It's like, whatever you merit, it's like you you decide who's going to have each job based on who merits it. So, for instance, like whoever's the best at performing surgery gets to be a surgeon. Like they pass all these tests, they have all these skills, they have all this knowledge. You choose the person who most deserves to be a surgeon to actually be a surgeon. And I don't know about you, I'm good with that. <laughs> like when, my, when our daughter had surgery, she's one year old, 
And we had this guy, and he was a great surgeon. We got to meet him. He was a Christian. He prayed with us before the surgery. It was amazing. After the surgery, we were supposed to have follow-up appointments. We couldn't have follow-up appointments with him because he got a new job at Mayo Clinic. I'm like, I think we had the right surgeon, right? I'm okay not getting the follow-up appointments. He did the surgery. He did great, right? So the point is, like, this is a meritocracy. The people who earn it and deserve it and who are good at doing surgery should be the surgeons. We're good with that in our culture. That's not God's economy, though. That's what's so hard to get through our heads. We don't deserve to be saved. None of us, not even Abraham, not even David, we don't earn that. You never have, you never will, nobody will. We don't earn it. It's not a meritocracy in God's economy. Even Sarah, right? She may have acted out of unfaith in giving Abraham her slave girl. But you know what's crazy? In the moment, Sarah might have thought she was doing a great act of faith. She might have actually thought, God promised this to my husband, and this must be the way that it's going to happen. Because it's not going to happen through me. Like, Sarah's lack of faith showed that she thought less of herself than what God did. She didn't deserve it, right? And God still used her, even when she didn't trust him and gave her husband her slave woman. She didn't earn that. She didn't earn that son. She was given that son. We must believe this, church. We must believe we can't and don't earn the righteousness that God offers us in the gospel. We don't earn. That's point one. None of our actions, right? Not our Bible reading, not our praying, not our church attendance record. None of that earns us what Jesus offers us in the gospel. Okay. Next. Second thing we believe. Even though we don't earn, our grievous sins are covered. So I love this in the text. He goes on and he says, likewise, David. And you can just stop there for a second. And, and if you don't know David's story, I'll, I'll kind of recap it really quick here. But this whole story could just pop into your mind right as you read that sentence. Likewise, David. Okay, speaking of getting things we don't earn, right? So David's this kind of Young boy, he gets chosen to be the next king while Saul is still the king and Saul's not pleasing God, right? And and he chooses David. Samuel comes and anoints him with oil. It's an amazing story. David, as he's kind of waiting, he knows that he's been called on by God to become the king. But he's waiting and Saul is still the king and Saul's actually coming after David. Saul's trying to kill David. David knows he's going to become king. David has opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't, right? He, he waits. He's like, God's going to do this in his way. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands and do it my way. It's great. Like, this whole story is great. Eventually, David becomes king, right? And it's all good. Until David starts to relax a little bit. And David's hanging out at home a little too much now, and the the troops are still off at battle, and instead of leading them out on the front lines, David's back at home. And you know what David does? He starts watching porn. That's what somebody told me recently. Like That's what this story basically is. David's looking out his window, right? And he sees the neighbor woman, Bathsheba. And he's like, she's desirable. And who knows? Maybe he saw her the first time. It was an accident. And then the next day, she was out there again at the same time. And then the third and fourth day, he starts making this a habit. And then he gets his slaves to go, or his servants to go get her and bring her to him, and David gets Bathsheba pregnant. And then, does he repent? No, not yet. Then, once he realizes he's gotten her pregnant, he gets her husband killed, How? By sending her husband out to the front lines of the battle where David should have been the whole time. This is all in the Bible, folks. These are crazy stories. 
So now, finally, his, his prophet Nathan comes and confronts him and gets David to confess and repent. And David realizes like he's this man after God's own heart. He's had all this favor, all this blessing given to him. And he sinned in this really, really dark way. And likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the person to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. David's sin, his grievous sins, have become very real to him. And as I'm going through this this week, it's like, David had a clear moral failure. And maybe that's you. Maybe you've failed, but this highlights the point of this sermon. God, this is the gospel. This is the sermon this morning. God credits righteousness apart from works. Still, it's the same thing. Like, whether we're talking about good works that make us feel like we earn it, We're talking about bad works that make us feel like we'll never deserve this. In both cases, God credits righteousness apart from works. We must believe this. David sees his sin in this realization that he's this sinner and he's forgiven. Here's what he writes in the psalm. This is quoting one of his psalms, Psalm 32. Blessed are those whose lawless acts are forgiven. He's like, my acts have been lawless, but I see that I'm forgiven. And do you know what my reaction is to that? It's not guilt and shame. It's I'm blessed. My lawless acts have been forgiven. I am blessed. It's not the person who tries to be a really good person and then says, you know, my acts have been forgiven. I deserve that. No, he's saying, I am blessed. Because he sees that he doesn't deserve it. Blessed is the person the Lord will never charge with sin. We must believe this, church. So, what it says in verse 7 is past tense. My sins are covered. Whoever sins are forgiven, whoever sins are covered, that person is blessed. It's not like they're still in the process of being covered and, and we're still, and you, you're still working on something. No, he's like, they are covered. There's no work left that you have to do because Jesus did the work on the cross. That's why he said, it is finished. The work that you never could do and are not worthy to do, Jesus Christ did for you and offers you that gift. This is supposed to be seen as a blessing. This is supposed to be good news. So I've been realizing lately that I, we partially, you know, this section of Romans, it talks about sin a lot. So it's like we have to talk about sin a lot and we should talk about sin. It's an important thing to talk about. But sometimes then I realize that I'll come in to preach a sermon and my motivation is to make everybody feel convicted because I was trying to make myself feel convicted all week and feel almost like guilty. Like I want to make sure we all feel guilty, you know, so that we really understand what's going on here. This week I'm reading my Bible because I'm just feeling weary and tired and I know in Isaiah chapter 40 there's something about The Lord gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless, right? But before I get to that part of the chapter, right at the beginning, Isaiah chapter 40, here's what it says. This just struck me like a bolt of lightning this week. He says, Isaiah, comfort my people. Comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of hard service is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned. Like, I don't need to come in here and and convict you. I need to come in here and comfort you. Your iniquity has been pardoned. 
The work has been done. Jesus Christ finished it on the cross. That's what grace is. That's what we preach about, is grace. Grace is the good news that that thing you feel, like that guilt you feel, Jesus already paid the price for that. It is paid. It is finished. We don't have more work to do in terms of our righteousness. We are given fully the righteousness of Jesus when we trust him in faith. So, we're going to do the, the cross bridge diagram. Have you guys ever seen this? You can go ahead and put this one up. So here's the cross bridge diagram. So there's man on the left and there's God on the right. And Romans 3.23, right? Sin separates us from God. So this is our position in life. Have you guys seen this? You sound like someone was like, oh, this is the old napkin gospel presentation. You can draw this on a napkin. You draw a man over here, God over here, and then what happens? Jesus comes in the middle. The work of the cross is the bridge that connects us back to God. Like, that's how we can get back to God. Here's my modification, church. Here's what this message is warning us against. We want to add to that. We feel like there's still work left for me to do. Like, Jesus, thank you for the cross. That's going to be a great safety net for my bridge that I build back to God. Just in case it's not quite good enough, then I'll, I'll rely on you. But really, I'm going to rely on myself. My hard work, my efforts, how I look in front of other people. So what happens? That's our work. And we're not seen through the lens of the cross. Do you guys like my art? Do you guys think I should do like... If we try to do it our way, it still doesn't work because our sins are still not covered. Do you see the problem? So reset it. Like, we want it to be harder than it is sometimes. This is what we've been saying a few times lately. There's no catch. Here's the gospel. We are separated from God. We walk to him. That's our faith. And I realize, I think it's actually crucial when you draw this diagram that it goes through the cross. Because this is what we're saying. The justification that Jesus earns for us on the cross is the only way we can be made right with God. Only through Christ crucified on the cross can we be made right with God. So, how do we apply this? Okay, it would be a shame if I made this whole sermon about how we don't have to work and then I gave you a bunch of work to do to apply the sermon. So I'm actually going to try to make your life easier this week with the application, okay? First, here's what you do. What did God tell Abraham? Go count the stars. That's how many children you're going to have. Here's what you guys do this week. Go count the stars, God has promised to bless you. Here's Ephesians 3. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is able to do way more than you could ever ask or think. God has promised things beyond your wildest imagination. And the way you get them is not by doing what Sarah did and trying to find your own way, right? It's just by walking in faith and receiving. Count the stars. Count the blessings. Count the blessings you have. Count the blessings you want. Count the blessings of eternity. You have so many reasons, like David, this week, to consider yourself blessed. And the first among all of them is your lawless acts are forgiven. Your sins are covered. The Lord will never charge you with sin. So count the stars. Count your blessings, right? Second one, don't take the stairs. You know how in fitness, like if you're trying to get healthy, you're supposed to, I'm not going to take the elevator. I'm going to take the stairs. You know, you have to do the hard way, right? In your faith, it's the other way around. Stop taking the stairs. What's the hard thing that you do, that you put yourself through, that you think earns you favor with God? Remember, I, I, at the very beginning, I was talking about the ark thing because I feel like 
It can be splitting hairs when you think about this. And I think the only person who knows the answer to this one is you, in your heart. Only you know if you're doing it out of faith or out of a lack of faith. Like, what's the Donald Whitney 12 spiritual disciplines? What's the spiritual discipline that you don't like? Stop doing it. Because guess what? It's not drawing you closer to Jesus. If you don't like it, stop doing it. Stop trying to earn righteousness. Fall in love with Jesus. Fall in love with his word. If you read it like it's a chore, man, change up your reading. If this doesn't give you life, like if you're not worshiping and singing songs because you love Jesus, but you're just here because you think somebody else wants you to be here, or it's a chore, or you think that this earns you more favor with God. No. Remove that burden. Stop taking the stairs. Okay, last one. Rest and worship. How does David respond when he realizes that he's forgiven? He just overflows with joy. I like Psalm 32 in the, in the CSB. Psalm 32 says, How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is the person the Lord does not charge with iniquity. Does your life have joy in it? Because if it doesn't, you might misunderstand the gospel. How joyful should we be when we see forgiveness? Like, are you trying to make this harder than it needs to be? Because you feel like you deserve to be sad? Jesus is not trying to make you more sad. He's not trying to make you feel more guilty. You have permission to be joyful. You have permission to receive forgiveness and walk forgiven. But the other one is rest. And I think these actually go hand in hand. Like, if you feel like you can't rest because you're too guilty, you're too guilty to rest, you have more to do, you still have to make up for your sins, you still have to earn something or prove something to someone else, you feel like this heavy burden from, from the church or from Christianity or from the Bible or from other, other people, Here's what Jesus says, okay? This, we're going to close, I'm going to try to let Jesus close out the sermon this morning. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 11. Do you know what your Lord says? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you feel a heavy burden, that's not the gospel. Jesus' yoke is light. He wants you to come to him when you are weary and burdened. Jesus invites you to his yoke. So we rest and we worship under Jesus' yoke. If you feel like you don't have time to rest, you know, it's like the, what they say about meditation. Like if you don't have an hour to meditate, you better make it two. I think it's that way with, with rest and worship. Like if you feel like you don't have time, you better double it. We have nothing left to earn. The test you already have an A plus on the test. The most important test in your life, in the gospel, you already got an A plus. What else are you trying to earn in this life? Why are you carrying a heavy burden? Walk forgiven. There is nothing we can earn in the gospel, church. That's the message this morning. There's nothing left for us to earn. We simply come in faith and we receive and like that cross diagram, we walk straight to God. We walk straight to Jesus this morning. And we take communion this morning. This is a reminder of the work that Jesus did so that we don't have to. Like, because we can't, 
This is a reminder of the work that Jesus did on the cross. So we have four tables around here, two in the back, two in the front. Gluten-free options available at every table. And if you believe that there is no work that you could do to earn salvation, but you believe Jesus did it for you and offers it to you as a gift, then we invite you to come. Eat the bread. It's a symbol of Jesus' body, which was broken on a cross for you. Drink the juice, which is a symbol of Jesus' blood, which was shed for you. Doing the work that he said, it is finished. There is nothing else you have to pay. In Jesus, you are viewed as righteous before God. Come to the table and remind yourself of that this morning anytime throughout the next couple songs. Let's pray. Jesus, I just want to take a moment this morning and sit and remember that we have nothing left to earn in the gospel. And thank you that we, we can't earn salvation but we thank you that you've offered it to us. And I ask Jesus that we would really stop and think about what you say in Matthew 11, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And I ask, Lord, for this congregation to test the yoke that's on their neck right now and to ask if they're carrying a heavy burden In Jesus, I I pray that they would turn to you and say, Lord, I give this to you because I can't carry it. That they would do that in trust and faith. That we would truly believe that in your economy, Lord, it's not a meritocracy. We don't merit, we don't earn the salvation that you offer. Truly, there is nothing for us to do but to receive and to thank. We receive it and we thank you, Jesus. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Let us walk today just renewed and refreshed in your gospel. Forgiven. And would that, would that be the word that's just resonating in our heads today? Not guilty. Forgiven. Justified. Blessed. And would we just take these next five, ten minutes and just worship and rest in you, Jesus. We pray this in your name, the name above all names. Amen.